Thank you very much. I I will speak in French. Is more easy to me. I am delighted to be here with you. Yesterday, I also attended, not during all the meeting, but I was still here to listen to some of the presentations, and I found them quite very interesting. I would like to contribute to these exchanges, and my presentation will be entitled Palmares, Ambrosio, and Congos, the Government Forms of African Diaspora in Brazil. So in Brazil, there are Maroons and Mocans. So we are talking about a very large territory where there are Mocans, which are small cities. And Congo refers to a sort of Congo in Brazil because we have several kingdoms of Congos which existed in the past as soon as the 17th century and it continues today. So there are endogenous governance systems in Brazil and this requires to think about resistance because it's related to social movements. They were domination exclusions up until the late 1980s. And this is why, on the one hand, there is subjugation of men and women, and on the other hand, there is extreme activism. So black men were related to slavery, to trade, and today, research studies have developed, and we start seeing research studies written by the Black community on the Black community. So this is a development, and the purpose is to extend exchanges, but also to have more in-depth thinking process to talk about enslaved men and women, and to talk about the African endogenous system of governance, which they received as a legacy. In the 1970s, there was the unified African movement, which emerged. And it is in this context that The, that the Zumbi became the, the reference point school in Africa. You can see Zumbi on the, on the screen. On the left, you can see another representation of the unified black movement. And it has been recognized that this was a, an endogenous governance system. So it became a symbol of the African resistance in Brazil, but it's not the single endogenous governance system. This system needs to be recognized as a system which was used to oppose slavery, whereas there were other spaces which accepted the system. So there were various forms of interpretation. Here we need to underline that unlike we, uh, contrary to popular belief, we could prove that there were a great deal of exchanges and trade, for example, in farming and among various cities. And this happened throughout the period. According to estimates, 
80% of uh, enslaved men and women came from this region. In the 16th century, there was a hierarchy in the socio-economic structure in Brazil. And all people, the king and vassals, had roles according to their ranks. There were also other populations which contributed to history. For example, quilambos, which means warrior. In Portuguese, they, uh, they have seen it as rebellion. So they captured slaves and they gave money to the people who hunted them. Now I'm going to talk to you about each quilombo. Here you can see a map of the Palamares. It is a map of 1766. There were up to 20,000 people in the quilombo. And five people who fled were already a kilom. So the, these were settlements at the time. And it accounted for 15% of the population. For two centuries, there were 10 Mokom, which were cities. And each one included 800 to 1,000 houses. Obviously, it wasn't an, a built house. But you know what I mean. And here you can see the hill of Barriga. It's a place where we can see the major black artists in Brazil. It's a significant place for us. The king of Palmares used to live here. And in the, in the other map, you can see the other Mokam. They were ruled by Kabmar. I don't have the original translation for this word. It's a Portuguese word. So they were ministers in inverted commas. They used to have exchanges to carry out trade with the host traders and salesmen in the region. He, it's Ambrosio. You can see another hill, the hill of Espia. This is an Ambrosio Mocomb. And there is another Ambrosio Mocomb, the one that you can see on the second picture. Right now, we are doing quite a lot of archeological research. There, you can see a satellite picture on screen. And this is a, a Mocam which is very large. It is made up of two different Mocam located in the largest Mocam called Campo Grande. This uh, took place in the 18th century. And this is the legacy of West Africa. And people used to move out in more distant places. They were giving their name to the places where they were settling, settling down. And each Mokam included 10 to 50 houses. So there were quite dispersed houses over a very, very big area. And here it's important to make a correlation between 
between the various mokombo that are characterized by the use of wood and the mokombo are safe in a way, they are protected with a fence in wood. Donc, pour conclure, uh, il y a aussi Right, okay, so to wrap up, basically there's also the Kingdom of Congo, which would be very interesting to uh, dwell upon, but I might not have the time to cover all these subjects unless some questions come up later in the discussion. I just wanted to say that it is also very important uh, when an event such as this one takes place, because it does introduce in the academic world some African agent agencies. Um, for example, that illustration dating back from 1766 was basically part of my presentation's point. Thank you for your attention.